Hello, everybody. Welcome to the welcome to a new episode of the Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined for a second time by Dr. Jeremy De Silva. He is a professor and chair of anthropology at Dartmouth College. He is a paleoanthropologist specializing in the locomotion of the first apes and early human ancestors. And today we're focusing on his book, First Steps, How Upright Walking Made Us Human. I'm also leaving a link in the description box to our first interview. So Dr. De Silva, welcome back to the show. It's always a pleasure to everyone. Thank you so much, Ricardo. It's, it's great to be talking with you again. Okay, so we are talking about human bipedalism here, but if you don't mind, I would like to go a little bit uh, back on our evolutionary history and ask you, do we know how old is bipedalism, evolutionarily speaking? And by the way, how common or uncommon it is across the animal kingdom? It's a great, it's a great question. So throughout evolutionary time, uh, bipedalism has popped up. It's evolved in a number of different lineages. And so your listeners would be quite familiar with the fact that T-Rex was bipedal. <laughs> um, so there's a whole lineage of, of dinosaurs. And of course, descendants of those dinosaurs today, the birds, um, are also bipedal. So ostriches and emus, some of these large terrestrial birds walk with a striding gait. Their anatomy is a little different than ours, but still, um, it's a it's a, a, a good comparison um, looking at these other uh, lineages that have um, evolved bipedalism. There are some species of lizard that have evolved bipedalism that went extinct. Um, there are even uh, lineages of, of crocodile that would occasionally rear up on two legs um, and move that way. Now, that that was a failed experiment. Crocodiles and alligators today are, are, are quadrupeds. And in fact, we sort of see that through evolutionary time, that bipedalism evolves and, and, then, and then often doesn't last um, and, and renders, you know, maybe that's not the cause, but uh, eventually the, that lineage um, goes extinct. So bipedalism is actually very rare. Um, I mentioned, you know, birds today, but if we just focus in on mammals, um, and look at the, you know, over 4,000, close to 5,000 different mammal species on the planet today, we are the only one that only moves on their two legs. Now, other animals will occasionally do it. Bears yeah. will occasionally move on two legs. Um, you know, I can get my dog to jump up on me and, <laughs> and dance a little bit on its two legs, but not for long. Um you know, you'll see meerkats and and uh, you know groundhogs occasionally get up on their two legs to peer into the you know distance for vigilance. Um, mm -hmm. But again, that's a that's a postural thing. It's quite unusual to see a mammal walk on two legs. Um, and in fact, when it happens, occasionally there'll be a zoo gorilla that moves on two legs, uh, and people film it and mm -hmm. put it on YouTube and it gets millions of hits. It makes the news. And yeah. it's something that we just do every day. We very much take take for granted. So I love that question because it's exactly why I'm fascinated by the origins and evolution of bipedalism mm -hmm. is because it checks these two boxes for me in that it's very unusual. And so it kind of demands an explanation. Um, why did bipedalism evolve? how did it evolve in our lineage when it's so rare in other mammals and then it's also ancient um mm -hmm. it's it's one of the first adaptations if not the first adaptation that we see uh, evidence for uh, in the human lineage and so it sort of jump starts our lineage it gets us um uh, it gets us going if you will <laughs> Yeah, and it's very interesting because at a certain point you mentioned their bipedal post posture because that's different from bipedal locomotion, right? Because bipedal posture is something, as you said, that some animals that are not really bipedal occasionally use in certain circumstances. And I would imagine that, for example, people would also look, you mentioned the gorilla there, but they would also look into chimpanzees, for example, who yeah. are very close to us, evolutionarily speaking. Right. And even when they occasionally stand upright, uh, I mean, they don't move exactly the same way as we do. Right. 
They don't. You're you're absolutely right. And and as you said, uh, bipedal posture is not terribly rare. Um, lots of mammals will do it. Um, and so there is a big difference between standing on your two legs and then actually navigating on two legs. Moving on two legs is a difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. Every time you take a step, you're then on one leg, which means you're incredibly imbalanced. Um, and humans have evolved all sorts of compensatory mechanisms at the ankle and the knee and the hip to make sure that we can stand on a single leg and not just fall over. Um, when other mammals do move on two legs, like the chimpanzee that you just mentioned, they can only do it for a couple of strides before they get absolutely exhausted and have to drop down on all fours again. And so they do it in particular circumstances if they're um, doing a territorial display. Sometimes they'll get up on two legs and go crashing through the bushes. Um, there's a lot of postural bi bipedalism in chimpanzees, and that gives us perhaps some insight into some of the precursors to bipedal locomotion. You know, it has to start somewhere. And so postural bipedalism uh, might be a good place to examine for, um, you know, what were the circumstances under which this uprightness was advantageous for our ancestors, uh, who then, with that as the foundation, could begin to take those those first steps and and actually locomote and navigate from point A to point B on two legs rather than on all fours. But with chimpanzees, I'm glad you brought that up, is their posture is is a crouched one. So they they have a bent knee and a bent hip. And so for your listeners, um, a really good exercise is to walk around like a chimpanzee. Um, it's exhausting. You'll work your quads, uh, all the muscles around the hip joints um, are, are getting exhausted when you do this kind of uh, a chimpanzee like, like walking. Um, so they can't do it for long. Um, humans on the, other, on the other hand, we have fully extended legs. And so we're not in a crouched position. So that extended knee, extended hip, the curve of the lower back, centering our body over our hips, over our knees, that allows us to walk and walk and walk and walk and walk. And we're incredibly energetically efficient uh, at moving on, on two legs. And so I would like to ask you now about what we know about the evolution of human bipedalism. But perhaps just before we get into human bipedalism itself, I would like to ask you, do we have a good idea about why actual bipedal locomotion seems to be so rare across the animal kingdom? I mean, mm -hmm. does it have, for example, anything to do with the sorts of anatomical changes that have to occur? And for them to occur, perhaps uh, animals have to be put through certain sp very specific evolutionary pressures for it mm -hmm. to then be transmitted as a trait across generations and to be maintained in a particular species? Does it have anything to do with it? You know, it's a, it's a great question. And it's one that I've puzzled over. Um, and I'm not sure I have a good answer for it. Um, if we look specifically at humans, there are, you know, we, we celebrate our upright walking, um, but there are real disadvantages to it. So because we move on two legs, um, we are stunningly slow compared to other uh, mammals. So the fastest human who's ever lived, Usain Bolt, um, the fastest he ever ran in his in his world record setting hundred meter dash was about twenty eight miles an hour. Yeah. Um, he peaked out at, at twenty eight, which is which is fast, but it's half the speed of a a a full sprint galloping leopard or lion or zebra or antelope, and so the predatory arms race in African mammals has led to those animals being able to run over 50 miles an hour, not for a long period of time, short distances. Uh, cheetahs, of course, are, are beyond that. They go over 60 miles an hour. Humans are half that. So we're stunningly slow. Um, and by moving on two legs rather than all fours, you are particularly susceptible to injury. And if you are injured, you then um, are, are even more compromised than an animal that moves on all fours that maybe injures a leg, but you still have three to navigate on. But with humans, if we, if we sprain an ankle or if we tear a ligament of the knee, um, we're immobile. 
And that would be incredibly dangerous and, and probably deadly for our evolutionary ancestors. And so if we think about, well, why hasn't bipedalism evolved in some other animals? I think it's probably because of these negative effects mm -hmm. of bipedalism that would have had to have been overcome by our mm -hmm. early ancestors. And we can talk about, you know, mm -hmm. later how I think we, we pulled that off because obviously mm -hmm. we did, <laughs> or we wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. um, but I really think it's some of these, these, uh, uh, these potentially negative aspects of bipedalism that may explain why we don't see it uh, more frequently in other, in other mammals. Mm -hmm. um, there are, you know, again, T-Rex, other dinosaurs, you know, could move on two legs and actually with their anatomical uh, sort of design, um, mm -hmm. they could move on two legs much faster, we think, than, than humans could. And in part, it's because of the tail that they had a very muscular tail that would allow um, uh, muscles of the legs then to have leverage as they're pushing off the ground. Um, humans don't have tails. Uh, we're apes. And so a lot of this is a legacy of our evolutionary history having descended not from birds, but, mm -hmm. but from apes. Um, and so without the tail, um, yes, we're more upright. Apes are more upright. And now we've taken that to an extreme with our bipedal locomotion, but but there are, there are costs to it. And again, I think those costs probably are, are pretty telling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's very interesting because uh, since we have all of those costs, there must have been some big advantages to counter those right. costs right and so let's get been. into let's get into that here so uh, sure. and start uh, to start at the beginning why did humans first stand upright because you know mm -hmm. over the years i've heard many different mm -hmm. stories hypotheses accounts uh, i've heard people saying that uh, ancient hominins at a certain point in Africa moved from the rainforest to the savanna, and so standing upright, they would be able to better uh, find, for example, predators at a distance, to locate them at a distance. Mm -hmm. They would free their hands and be able to carry things, to use their hands to create tools, and so on and so forth. And then there are other just so stories that I will yes. get into in a sure. bit, but do we know exactly how things went back? Then? No, we sure don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's one of these, you know, these these big questions we still have in our in our discipline of why was bipedalism selectively advantageous? Um, and you know, just for to to return back to that point you made a second ago of how rare it is. Um, I wish it wasn't. If there were more mammals that were bipedal, then they would give us models yeah. to test some of these hypotheses of why bipedalism was advantageous in, in early humans. Right. But because it's a singular thing in mammals, that makes it much more difficult to try to figure out. Um, this is also uh, uh, a, 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 an area that's difficult for us to, to, uh, to sort of navigate because we don't have many fossils. Um, of the time period when bipedalism was really taking hold. Um, and so it's been sort of uh, one of these open questions for a long time. I mean, Lamarck wrote about why we walked on two legs and he thought it was to see over tall grass. Darwin, as you mentioned, wrote about freeing the hands to make and use uh, tools. Yeah. And these are testable propositions, the tools at least. And we know that bipedalism precedes stone tool construction by at least 3 million years, maybe 4 million, maybe more. And so the timing of that doesn't seem quite quite right. Um, and so for as many researchers as there are in, in our discipline, there are as many hypotheses for why bipedalism evolved. So the simple answer is we don't, we don't know. Um, uh, I think it's a mistake to think about one reason. I think um, as we dive into, into the evolutionary history of humans, we always find that things are more complicated than we first thought. I suspect there are probably multiple reasons why this was advantageous. I also think that the fossil evidence that we see early, early, early in our lineage um, is one of variation and different kinds of bipedalism emerging uh, and evolving in different habitats. And so I'm of the thought right now um, 
given the fossils we have, and again, there aren't many, but given what we do have, I'm of the thought that bipedalism may be evolved multiple times in different habitats, perhaps even for different reasons. And some of those reasons might include energetics, um, moving on two legs with an extended leg is a very energetically e efficient way to move. And so if there are limited resources and getting from point A to point B, uh, some individuals can move on their two legs on an extended knee, at least uh, an extended hip. Uh, they won't use as much energy and they may be able to survive uh, periods of, of, you know, low food availability. Um, I, I also think that because it compromises us in terms of locomotion, um, it makes us slow. It makes us uh, susceptible to injury. Um, I like hypotheses that sort of take you away from locomotion and say, well, what else could it be good for? And the freeing of the hands um, is, is you know, s such a, an obvious thing that bipedalism allows us to do. And in this way, I think we can look to the other bipedal animals out there, the birds, by moving on their two legs, they've freed their arms for, for wings, right? And they have taken it in this new direction of being able to, yes, locomote, but in a different way. Now, we don't use our, our arms to fly, um, but we can now, you know, once, once you uh, eliminate that responsibility of locomotion from the arms, you can use your hands uh, to carry things, to carry babies, to carry food. Um, and so some of those hypotheses, I, th I think, are, are, are compelling about food sharing uh, within a group. And that might allow us to overcome some of those uh, 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 energy problems that our early hominid ancestors would have mm -hmm. had as they're navigating on the ground um, and uh, in an environment that maybe, uh, you know, at times has, has limited food resources. So ultimately the, the, the answer is we don't know. Um, it's one of the great questions in our science, one of the great unanswered questions. Hopefully, you know, future generations will have more evidence and we'll, we'll look at this in, in, in other clever ways that we haven't thought of uh, to try to get at this get at this question, but the last thing that I'll mention on this, and maybe this will lead us into the next sort of question, next discussion, mm -hmm. yeah. is that a lot of our work in this arena of thinking about the origins of bipedalism, we always think of us evolving from a knuckle walker, from something like a chimpanzee, mm -hmm. and there are many studies that have looked at well, what are the circumstances under which chimpanzees move on two legs, and then use that to uh, uh, to interrogate some of these ideas about why early humans moved on two legs and and I and I think that's worthwhile I definitely think that those are those are worthy uh, questions to be asked um, but there is the possibility and I think the fossils right now are bearing this out um, that we never did go through a knuckle walking phase that the last common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees and gorillas may have been something that was already more upright, upright in the trees, not upright on the ground. Mm -hmm. And that would mean that knuckle walking would have independently evolved in gorillas and in chimpanzees as they evolved their long arms and their long fingers for climbing. And then as they moved on four, uh, on all fours, they would need to tuck those fingers underneath their wrists for stability during, during walking. But if that's the case, then upright walking itself wouldn't be as new as we think it is, that that would be sort of a co-opted locomotion from an ancient ape that was already posturally, back to posture, that was already posturally more upright in mm -hmm. the trees. So it wouldn't necessarily be a lo new locomotion. It would just be a new way of moving in a, in a new setting. Uh, instead mm -hmm. of in the trees, uh, it would be down on the ground. So there are these fascinating fossils that are emerging from sites in Southern Europe. Um, the most recent discovery um, that spoke to this was from a site in Germany of a roughly 11 million year old ape called Danuvius. And Danuvius, um, uh, at least from the knee and the ankle, looks like it could occasionally at least stand up on two legs in the trees and maybe even navigate through the trees with hand-assisted bipedalism. Um, and the last uh, point I'll make with this is that um, in some ways that, that, that mirrors what we see in the Asian apes. Mm 
So orangutans and gibbons are upright a lot um, and will navigate in the trees in a very upright kind of way. And so they may be better models for thinking about um, early hominin locomotion uh, than, than the African apes are, even though the African apes are our closest living relatives because they've evolved too. And thinking of them as time machines and what our ancestors may have looked like might, might, might be a mistake. Mm -hmm. But I mean, uh, I'm going to ask you in a second about some of the main anatomical changes that had to occur for us to be mm -hmm. able to have a, an actual uh, bipedal locomotion, at least as we have it now. But uh, I mean, please correct me if I'm wrong, but even if we didn't go through a knuck walking, knuckle walking phase, uh, these should have been a progressive uh, thing, right? I mean, it's not mm -hmm. that uh, suddenly we were all uh, moving on all fours and someone was born <laughs> with That's all right. the anatomical changes in the spine, in the pelvis, in the That's knees, right. the legs, the feet, and all of that. And then it was so good that suddenly it spread across the populations and all of that. It was progressive. Right. That's exactly right. And, and, you know, evolution works by frequency changes. And so, um, you know, you could have a population and we do, we do have populations of apes today where bipedalism is part of what they do. Chimpanzees don't move bipedally very frequently, uh, but, but they do occasionally do it. And when they do it, they move and take, you know, eight, nine, 10 steps. And you can imagine a scenario where, you know, a population of chimpanzees has some anatomical tweak to it that allows it to energetically move on two legs instead of 10 steps, 12, 14, 16. Mm -hmm. um, and they do it maybe, you know, 20% of their day rather than 5% of their day. And if that confers some advantage to that group and those individuals who can move in that way have more offspring and they pass on whatever musculoskeletal anatomy allowed them in the first place to move on their two legs like that, then that's how this could get rolling. Um, what I would suggest though, is that the body plan of a, of a say a gibbon um, or a siamang, a, an Asian ape, um, predisposes them to bipedalism a little bit better than an, an African ape does. They have a, a longer lower back, they can extend at the hip and at the knee a little bit more than the African apes can. And so with that as the precursor, then getting this sort of ball rolling becomes a little bit easier. Because um, one of the one of the things we've we've struggled to to uh, to explain is how these early hominins would have survived what you're describing these kind of transitional periods from something that yeah. is not bipedal to something that is bipedal moving through this phase where it's where it's practicing bipedalism in a lousy way and being a lousy biped um might be you know it, it already is it already does make us a good biped is slow and vulnerable to injury what about a lousy biped right <laughs> And so that's why, again, it makes more sense to me that the last common ancestor would have been more upright to begin with, again, in the trees. And then as there are environmental changes, then your body is already predisposed to move in this kind of way, just on this new landscape. And then, yes, there would be anatomical tweaks that happen to that body, but it already it has okay. sort of the foundational elements for moving uh, onto, on two legs. Okay, so before we talk about the main anatomical changes that had to occur, let me just ask you this. And uh, I mean, the reason I'm asking you this is because every single time I do an interview with an anthropologist on human bipedalism, without fail, someone comes in on the comment section and says, oh, how, what about the aquatic ape sure. hypothesis yeah. and sure. i mean as far as i understand it and please correct me if i'm wrong it's been thorough thoroughly debunked and i don't think there are many anthropologists out there that think that the aquatic ape hypothesis for the evolution of human bipedalism as holds any water but what do you think <laughs> no pun intended right um so <laughs> Uh, well, like I said, we still don't know why bipedalism evolved and, uh, you know, all ideas remain on the table. Um, 
what I'm skeptical of are folks that that are thoroughly convinced 100% that they have the answer. And yes, I see that often with the crowd that you're talking about, um, that they are 100% convinced that humans evolved bipedalism uh, to navigate through a watery landscape. Yeah. And these are, you know, these are testable ideas, right? So we can look at the environments in which we see bipedalism uh, in early, early hominins. Uh, and sure enough, they're, they're, often found we're in the vicinity of water. Look, we need water to, to yeah. survive. Uh, many animals do. That's also where things fossilize are in watery landscapes. But there's no evidence at all that we were using uh, the watery environments. All of the anatomical changes and in the anatomies that we see in these early hominins are conducive for an arboreal environment living in, in, in trees and navigating terrestrial bipedalism, moving on the ground. And here's another example of where we can look at other mammals. There are other mammals who have uh, evolved watery adaptations from a terrestrial ancestor. We see this in, in whales, you see it in hippos, you see it in otters and seals. You know, seals are essentially aquatic dogs, right? They're carnivores. Yeah. And we see all sorts of changes that happen to the ears, that happen to the position of the eyes, that happen in terms of streamlined body. And we mm -hmm. don't see any of those in early human ancestors. And I guess the last thing that I would say is that the environment itself, we find fossils of um, uh, crocodilians. We find fossils of ancient hippos in these uh, areas. Um, this is a really dangerous place to be. If and again, you know, the land is too. You know, full of leopards and lions or ancient ancient carnivores. Um, but the the water is not necessarily a, a, a safe spot uh, either. And so I think it's very unlikely that mm -hmm. bipedalism emerged in these sort of watery environments. Um, with with the aquatic ape idea, there are many different sort of versions of it um, mm -hmm. that go as as wild as as you know the idea of mermaids and that there are human <laughs> mermaids out there. And so there are a lot of you know sort of com completely unsupported uh, pseudo scientific ideas. Um, and then what I think of sort of aquatic ape light um, and, and more reasonable are some of these ideas about swampy environments or us moving. Uh, in in areas where there are a lot of sort of aquatic plants that maybe we were exploiting. Um, mm -hmm. That could very well be the case, but it was that then the driver for why bipedalism evolved? I don't think so. I, 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 I think uh, the evidence pretty strongly points against that. Um, but uh, you know we'll we'll see as we find more as we find more evidence. but but yes, in general, the aquatic ape is is, is not taken very seriously by by the scientific community. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, and I mean, just to be clear, I was making a bit of fun of this idea, this hypothesis, but, yeah. but I, perhaps what I was making more fun of was the attitude of people that sort of thinking in absolute terms of, oh, it's this is 100% correct, all the other hypotheses are 100% incorrect, and that's the truth about it, and that's it. Basically. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's funny. There, there are dozens and dozens of hypotheses for why bipedalism evolved. Um, this is the only one that seems to have a fan club, um, <laughs> which is is just bizarre to me. I don't quite understand it. Um, and uh, you know, I mean, there, okay, another testable. So Herman Ponser, who was at Duke University, recently published a paper um, that looked at uh, human use of water. Um, and how, uh, you know, based on the physiology of how we use water, um, humans evolved in areas where there was not much water um, and that we evolved the ability to retain water uh, for our survival. Well, if we were evolving in an aquatic area, it, the results would have been opposite. Um, so again, these are sort of, these are testable ideas. Um, and that doesn't mean that we didn't use watery landscapes. I mean, there's really good evidence yeah. of us acquiring you know fish and mussels and aquatic animals you know at a site that's two million years old um but as we go back in time and look at you know early hominins where were they living six million years ago um they're living at forest edges you know it's a, a usually a mosaic environment where there are grassland environments there are forest patches uh they're eating ripe fruit um 
navigating the forest landscape, but then moving from food patch to food patch through, we think, grassy environments. Was there water nearby? Of course there was. You know, we're talking about mosaic environments, but were they spending all their time there? There's no evidence for that. Mm -hmm. So about the anatomical changes, of course, we don't have time here to go through all the yeah. tiny details, but what would you say are some of the main changes in terms of, for example, our spine, our hips, sure. our legs, our feet that had to occur for us to be able to walk as we do now? Yeah, yeah. So one of the wonderful things about bipedalism and what it kind of does to our body is that you see little hints and little clues of bipedalism in just about every single bone in our body. It's really difficult to not be able to pick up these subtle little differences between us and say an African ape. And it goes right from our, from our heads all the way down to the tips of our toes. So even the position of the hole at the bottom of our skull, it comes out the back of a skull in an animal moving on all, all fours and it comes out the bottom of the skull um, in in us. You know that's where our neck is, the the bottom of our of our skull. So you wouldn't think that from a skull you'd be able to tell if something moved on two legs, but you can from the position of that of that hole. Um, but you want more evidence, right? And really, you want evidence from the the working parts of the body that are involved during bipedalism. So feet and knees and hips and backs. Um, those are really the hot spots for understanding the anatomies associated with bipedalism. Uh, so in the foot, which is you know my area of, of expertise, um, the ankle becomes more square shaped uh, so that we can move in a single plane. The heel enlarges uh, for heel strike bipedalism. Uh, eventually an arch of the foot develops, but before that the foot stiffens. Um, apes walk on feet that are very flexible, very moldable that allow them to grab onto tree branches. But that's not a good foot for pushing off the ground. It's like walking in big slippers. Um, instead, what we see in human early hominins, very early, is that ligaments help anchor together, especially the outside of the foot. And that seems to be the region that evolves first for, the, for propulsion, for pushing off the ground. The knee is a great place to find evidence for bipedalism. Humans are a knock-kneed species. Our knees grow together. We're not born this way. Our knees are quite distant from each other, like an apes would be when we're first born. But the act of walking uh, changes the, the forces on the growth plate of the knee, and it causes the knee to angle inwards. And this is called a bicondylar angle. And because it happens developmentally, it means if you find a fossil and it has that angulated knee, then that individual had to have walked on two legs because that's the only way you get that kind of anatomy. So it's not something you're born with. It tells you about the life of that individual. Uh, and we have knees that go back uh, close to 4 million years that show this kind of uh, anatomy. Uh, the hip joint, another great place to find evidence for bipedalism. What's happened with our pelvis um, is that it's shortened and it's curved so that the muscles um, that in apes cause them to extend their legs, which is very helpful during climbing. Those same muscles have now been repositioned, just tweaked a little bit so that they're on the sides of the body. And what they do is they allow you to balance on a single leg without tipping over. We were talking about chimpanzees earlier. When they take a step and lift a leg, they can't balance on a single leg so they fall over and they just wobble back and forth. But because of the repositioning of those muscles around the hip, uh, humans today, and we can tell from fossils, this is another one of these ancient anatomical changes that allow us to balance on a single leg when we're moving on, on two legs. And finally, with the lower back, uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans have very short, stiff lower backs, um, and it prevents them from, from bringing their bodies uh, and, and sort of curving their bodies up over their hips. So the small of the lower back that we have um, that is caused by the curvature of our lower spine, um, that's something that, that, that uh, is relatively unique to us amongst, amongst the great apes. And again, it allows us to position our torsos up over our hips. So if you find an isolated fossil vertebra, 
or a piece of a pelvis or a piece of a hip joint or a piece of a knee or a piece of an ankle or mm -hmm. any of the foot bones, you can tell that you have something that moves on, on two legs. Right. Uh, and so um, earlier you mentioned briefly uh, using Bolt, for example, and mm. uh, how he was able to run so fast, but of course not as fast as, for example, the big felines, the big cats and other right. animals like that. But uh, even if we are not able to run as fast as them, we seem to have more endurance. We do. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we have extraordinary endurance, um, and that's both in walking and in and in running. Um, walking uh, is so efficient in humans um, that if you wanted to, you know, lose a, a a pound of of weight, and you started walking to do it, and this is again, it depends on the parameters of the person and the speed at which they're walking, and all those in the terrain and all those things. But but on average, an average human. Uh, would have to walk about 70 miles, 70 miles to uh, to lose a pound of weight. And it's because we're too good at it. Um, now, you want to lose that pound fast, you swim. And this gets back to that aquatic ape idea. We're not good swimmers. And because we're not good swimmers, we use a lot more energy when we're, when we're swimming. Um, and so that's an excellent uh, exercise. Now, it doesn't mean walking's not good for you. You know, I have a family member that has used that information to say, well, I don't need to walk then. You know, I can just sit on my couch all day. And I said, no, 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 no. Walking, walking is really good for you in all sorts of other physiological ways. But in terms of losing weight as a, as a, you know, a dietary mechanism, you know, it's, it's about what you're taking into your body rather than, rather than walking. Um, Running is, is better in terms of, uh, uh, you know, sort of a calorie burning uh, exercise, but still uh, running, uh, uh, we're quite efficient at that too. Um, we probably weren't always. It seems like the early hominins, when we look at the fossil record of some of these early hominins living five, six, seven million years ago, um, they still have grasping big toes for climbing trees, for getting into trees at night, that would have compromised their ability to push off the ground during bipedalism. So they wouldn't have been as efficient walking on two legs. Um, when we get to Lucy and her kind around three and a half million years ago, this is a group called Australopithecus, um, they seem to have all the hallmarks for walking on two legs in a very efficient kind of way. Their legs are a little shorter than ours. Some of the muscle attachments are a tad different. The arch of the foot doesn't appear to be quite as developed as it is in humans today. But these are sort of the, the finishing touches of a, of a biped rather than the, the, the key elements. They have all the key elements. Um, and so I think they're walking a lot like we do in very, very efficient ways. But some of these final changes that we see with uh, genus Homo, typically uh, uh, what, what your listeners would think of as Homo erectus, longer legs, uh, more springy elements in the foot. Uh, 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 these have been argued by a colleague of mine at Harvard, Dan Lieberman, to be important uh, pieces of, uh, or anatomical changes associated with running um, and the efficiency of distance running, mm -hmm. um, which again, we're quite good at. Um, humans are excellent uh, endurance runners. Um, even if, you know, individuals listening, if, you know, you may say, well, you know, I, well, I hate running, you know, and, and so you personally may not uh, enjoy it or, or think you're good at it. But as a species, um, we're actually really, really good at it. Um, and think, you know, tens of thousands of people, probably hundreds of thousands of people every year, like willingly line up to run 26 miles. <laughs> uh, it seems like a pretty crazy thing to do. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we do it and we can do it with, you know, surprisingly little training. Um, humans are just good runners. Mm -hmm. And again, it gets, it gets back to our endurance. You know, humans actually have a tremendous amount of endurance compared to some of these other mammals we talked about mm -hmm. that can sprint, yeah. uh, but then they can't do it for long periods of time. Right. And does our endurance have anything to do, or is it connected in any way to our ability to sweat? Oh, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's spot on. Um, and you know, there's a there's this wonderful sort of um, uh, uh, combination of variables that's allowing our ancestors to survive and thrive um, 
in a hot equatorial African environment, you know, three and a half, two and a half million years ago with Australopithecus to genus Homo, exactly um, when that transition happened is unclear. Some of the anatomies I'll talk about next when they changed is 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 unclear, but I think they're all interrelated. Um, that, uh, you know, Australopithecus uh, began to spend more and more and more of its time of its day on the ground, uh, navigating its environment for food. Um, we can tell from the isotopes of the teeth of Australopithecus that they start eating everything. Um, they're not picky eaters anymore like apes are. Apes are very picky eaters, ripe fruit. Uh, yes, they'll occasionally eat meat. Uh, they'll supplement it with leaves here and there. Um, but humans today, um, as a species, we've eaten everything. Right. If it if it has DNA in it, we've tried it. And so it's an interesting sort of question of, well, when did that happen? When did this sort of dietary breath evolve? And it seems to take hold in Australopithecus. And I think it's because you can't afford to be a picky eater if you're living on a landscape full of predators and you're moving in a way that makes you slow and vulnerable. Right. You have to you, you start eating everything. And, and I suspect that, that they did. Um, but foraging for food in the early morning hours or the, the, you know, the, the, the dusk hours, right? Dawn and dusk, and certainly not at night, those would be extremely dangerous times to navigate uh, your environment for food. And so when did Australopithecus go out and search for food and dig up grubs and tubers and get fruit and, and, and scavenge carcasses? I think it happened during the day, which is kind of when we're active, right? During the daytime. If you go on safari in Africa today and you go at noontime, you don't see much. Mm -hmm. All the animals are asleep. They're under trees. They're resting. They're trying to get away from the heat. Whereas humans are very active during the day. I mean, you were just talking earlier before we came on about the, the you know, the, the, the heat in Southern Europe, um, we're, we're in Vermont right now. We're having a heat wave as well. Um, and, and yeah, it's difficult, but humans can still be quite active even in those warm, warm temperatures. Of course, if it gets too warm, uh, then it's, then it's problematic. Um, but even, you know, temperatures in the eighties and nineties, we can be quite, quite active. Um, you're not going to be active if you're wearing a fur coat. And so, early hominins at this time, Australopithecus, it's been hypothesized that they began to lose some of their body hair, that the furriness of an ape is beginning to go away at that time. And that helps cool them down. But another means by which they could cool down, as you mentioned earlier, would be sweat glands. And so having sweat glands, and primates have sweat glands, they just don't have the same frequency, the concentration that we do. And so again, the starting point is there and you just increase the frequency and those individuals can dissipate body heat more effectively. Um, moving bipedally with sweat glands in this kind of environment um, allows you to cool off faster. Less of your body is exposed to the sun. This is a, a what's called the thermoregulation hypothesis developed by Peter Wheeler and Leslie Aiello. So they tied this into uh, uh, this again form of locomotion of, of bipedalism. So I think I think diet and body hair and sweat glands and and energetic bipedal locomotion in this kind of environment it's all tied together. And I think these things are co-evolving um, in Australopithecus as we start to get. The transition into homo mm -hmm. so throughout our conversation we've been alluding here and there to some of the benefits and costs we got from our bipedalism and perhaps also to illustrate some of that and to give the audience a better idea of how to think about costs and benefits here uh how did bipedalism set the stage for the evolution of some of our other traits, like for example, let's start with the example of human birth. So what mm, were some yeah. of the costs that it brought to the table there? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, so uh, when we compare our, our birth process and the mechanism of birth in humans to our closest living ape relatives, um, it's quite a dramatic difference. Um, when apes, uh, they usually have a gestation of, of eight or even nine months. 
Um, so it's a long time, uh, like it is in, in us. Um, mm -hmm. And the baby is typically facing down uh, like it does in humans. Um, but then labor in a chimpanzee usually lasts only about 40 minutes, which is pretty unheard of in humans. And the baby is born uh, facing up. Um, and so what, what a person today would think of as a sunny side up birth, um, which is um, off, often it can lead to complications in, in humans, that, that facing up kind of birth. So the best birth outcomes happen in humans when there's rotation. And so the baby corkscrews through the birth canal. But the challenging aspect of that, and this happens in, in, in you know, upwards of 85 to 90% of vaginal births, where there's this corkscrewing of, of, of the baby through the birth canal, and the baby is born facing backwards. But because of that, um, assisting with your own birth becomes dangerous for the, for the infant. Chimpanzees don't have birth assistants. But humans do. This is a cross-cultural universal. No matter where you go on earth, humans, and typically it's experienced women, midwives, uh, doulas, will, will assist with the delivery of the baby. And mechanistically, this is important because if they didn't, and the mother was delivering her own baby, she could exert a, um, a, a torque or a pressure uh, a, or a twisting force, if you will, on the neck of the infant and that can cause damage to the baby uh, when during delivery. So this rotational birth then, you know, something very mechanistic, um, leads to the necessity of having helpers during delivery. So making it a social event. Um, now, to tie that into bipedalism, um, there are some key changes. I mentioned already the curving of the hip joint to sort of the, the, you know, so that the muscle attachments are on the side of the body and the shortening of the pelvis. Well, all of these changes that affect how you walk on two legs that affect bipedalism have also changed the shape of the birth canal compared mm -hmm. to our distant ancestors. And if you take Lucy, the very famous Australopithecus Lucy, uh, she was discovered with a beautifully preserved pelvis. And if you try to birth a chimpanzee baby through that pelvis, you can't unless it rotates through like a human. And so just based on sort of the mechanics of birth, I think that Australopithecus during Lucy's time was already engaged in this sort of um, social behavior of midwifery during childbirth, that it would have increased the, the likelihood of successful birth. Um, the birth would have been difficult at that time, uh, labor would have been longer um, and it would have been uh, uh, dangerous enough that having helpers there uh, would, have been, would have been beneficial. And so there's this, I think this really elegant and beautiful connection between the way we walk, between bipedalism and the way we interact with each other, uh, with, with sociality. And birth is a great example of that. Another example of it uh, would be the the number of fossils that we have found that have evidence of healed fractures. Um, so there's a um, a skeleton of Lucy's species. Uh, it's from an individual known as Katanumu. Katanumu means big guy in the local language. He lived about three and a half million years ago in what's today Ethiopia, and his uh, he was discovered by Johannes Haile Selassie. Uh, and this would have happened about uh, 15 years ago. Uh, the discovery was was first made. Beautiful, beautiful skeleton. Um, but when the researchers closely examined the shin bone, they found evidence that um, uh, he had, probably as a child, he had broken his shin bone. He had broken his tibia. Um, but then it healed. And he grew to be an adult. And mm -hmm. so... Imagine this situation, three and a half million years ago, you're on a landscape full of predators. There are no doctors, there are no hospitals. And this poor individual maybe was running or, or you know, stepped in a hole or fell out of a tree. We don't know what happened. Something happened that led to a broken shin bone. Yeah. This would, you know, for a person today, you'd have to get a cast. Uh, you'd be on crutches. You'd probably be in a wheelchair for some time. Um, navigating the world would be very difficult. Um, right. 
Now imagine that person, you know, on a savanna environment three and a half million years ago. Um, this individual shouldn't have survived, mm -hmm. but but they did. They healed. They survived long enough to grow and to be an adult. And to me, that is clear cut evidence that other members of the group were helping. That that uh, empathy and compassion um, and care for others is is deeply rooted in who we are and i see it as intimately connected with this vulnerable form of locomotion that i don't think could have evolved um unless we were taking care of each other i think those two things have to be connected um otherwise it's a it's a you know a very difficult thing to explain uh the fossils that we have that that show evidence of these healed fractures not fractures that cause death healed fractures um and there are many of them mm -hmm. and by the way i mentioned human birth because actually if i understand it correctly the changes bipedalism brought uh, had a major impact not only in how women gave birth to children but also uh, were connected to things like infant mortality maternal mortality and even the way we parent our kids and the the sort of phases of development we go through compared to other great apes, for example, in terms of infancy, childhood, adolescence, and the periods, I mean, the number of years associated with each of those phases. Sure, yeah. It's... Um... You know what, what we can tell from from the few fossils that we have of infants and and children. These are very rare fossils. The bones of infants and children don't fossilize as easily as the bones of adults, because adult bones are more mineralized to 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 begin with, uh, and denser, just denser. Um, but there are some extraordinary skeletons that we have, um, uh, including one again from Lucy's species. It's known as the Dikika child. Um, and the Dikika child was about two and a half years old um, when when she died. Mm -hmm. And that species didn't have very large brains at all. Their brains were uh, only slightly larger than a chimpanzee's. Brains were about the size of gorilla brains, but in bodies that were more chimpanzee sized. So, the, so slightly encephalized. But what was really fascinating about the Dikika child uh, when it was closely studied by a, a team of scholars led by Zariah Lemziged, who's a, um, a researcher at the University of Chicago, um, is that based on the teeth, uh, this species was was growing up fast. And so they didn't have necessarily this elongated childhood like you see in humans today. That seems mm -hmm. to have happened uh, later in our evolutionary journey. So even though they were bipedal, they still were growing up fast, which I, I, I would suspect is tied to heavy predation, um, that again, they're vulnerable on that landscape and enough of them are getting picked off that they got to grow up fast. Otherwise, that's a recipe for extinction. But the part of them that was not growing up fast was their brain. So the Dikika child had a much smaller brain, given her age, than you would have expected for something growing like a chimpanzee or growing like a gorilla. Instead, she had slowed down brain growth. So it would have taken her longer to grow a, 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 an adult-sized brain. Um, and that to me is, and, and the researchers who published this paper made what I thought was a really compelling argument um, that this is evidence for learning, that this is evidence that individuals are growing up in a group and they're learning how to be in, in Australopithecus um, and that that's going to require, you know, a, a, a group and lots of social behavior, social interactions with lots of group members. And that's where I think, you know, again, tied to bipedalism, this connection between moving on two legs, having lots of individuals in a group who have, you know, their eyes on the horizon looking for the predators, um, and then taking good care of these, these little kiddos as they're growing up and teaching them. How to how to be how to be an Australopithecus. Um, so again, all these sort of you know behavioral elements, which it's one of the things I love about about what we do, um, because what we pull out of the ground are just old bones. Mm 
but these old bones tell these beautiful stories about these individuals and the lives they had. And then we can sort of take a step back and see with a wider lens how they sort of inform these major developmental changes that happened over the course of our evolutionary journey. Yeah, and it is really fascinating because I would imagine that as someone who didn't have any idea of the things we're talking about here uh, would never have probably linked uh, bipedalism to something like our life history or so, or right. the way we parent, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and you know, with the with the way we parent, um, uh, again, you know, as a scientist, I, I I'm supposed to remain fully, you know, uh, objective about my mm -hmm. my subjects and. Um, but the reality is science is done by humans and, and humans have lives and life experiences that yeah. then very strongly influence how they think about their, you know, the thing they study. Um, <clears throat> and so my, my kids now are 13 years old. Um, they just became teenagers. Um, but 13 years ago, 14 years ago, uh, when my wife was pregnant with, with, with our twins, um, I started thinking about what pregnancy was like in an Australopithecus. And, and then when we had our kids um, and, and I, I had firsthand experience with sort of the challenges of, you know, parenting that first year um, and carrying around just this luggage that you know can't really move much, but incredibly demanding. Um, and they take, you know, uh, up a lot of, a lot of energy and, um, Again, I started thinking about Australopithecus and, and the challenges of having little kids. Um, and what was it like to have a newborn or a toddler? Um, and the the thinking was sort of like this, that if you know, if you're an Australopithecus and you're and you're bipedal, then you've lost a lot of the grasping abilities with your feet. Your your feet are now much better at propulsion than they are at grabbing. And mm -hmm. the fossils bear this out. Um if they're living on a landscape that is, um, as I was mentioning earlier, is uh, uh, quite warm, if they're active during the day, then they probably have reduced body hair. Yeah. And so the infants don't have much to, to grab onto. Um, and you're bipedal, so you can't just throw a kid on your back like a chimpanzee does, otherwise it would slide right off. So you have to actively carry your kid, right? And this leads to me, to me, it could lead to, to one of two or maybe both solutions. Um, one is that uh, organic technology actually goes much farther back than we think in terms of making slings to carry mm -hmm. infants. Um, we have stone tools from around 3.3 million years. So hominids are beginning to manipulate tools in their environment to make a, a an object that they can use to acquire resources, um, something like a, a, a sling made of, you know, leaves and, and, and fibers from plants or even animal tissue that wouldn't preserve. Um, but, you know, I, I want to leave it open as a possibility and hopefully some clever students someday will figure out how do we test that hypothesis that they were making slings. Um, but an equally likely scenario or maybe a, a scenario happening in parallel uh, is that when an Australopithecus mom, say, needs to get up into a tree to get some fruit or wants to go build a night nest to go to sleep because, you know, the sun is setting and the predators are coming out, um, she's supposed to climb that tree with a newborn with one arm? I don't see it. And so instead, it seems quite obvious to me that she would have handed that baby off to others. Um, now, in human society, it's that's very obvious that you would have helpers, that you would have, you know, a neighbor or an auntie or a cousin or somebody, another sibling or, or you know, one of the other parents that you would hand the kid off to. Mm -hmm. um, but this is unheard of in chimpanzee world. And so apes don't, uh, uh, what we call alloparent. There aren't uh, uh, other individuals in the group mm -hmm. that help with the infants the right. way you see in humans. And so, um, again, once again, I think bipedalism creates this scenario mm -hmm. by which this behavior that we all take for granted of us sort of ogling babies and helping out um, is something that 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 co-evolves uh, mm -hmm. with this unusual form of, of, of locomotion. Um, 
so it's it's connect yeah uh, you know it's connected to all these these things we sort of celebrate as 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 you know human attributes right so just one last question then and perhaps this is again mostly focused on the costs and not so much the benefits mm. but uh, when it comes to our bipedalism, and since nowadays in many societies across the globe, we live in modern industrialized or post-industrial societies where we are very sedentary. I mean, particularly in mm. service economies, we spend most of our days sitting on a chair eight hours, eight plus hours a day in an office. I mean, what kind of implications does our being bipedal have for our health uh, in our later stages of life? And I mean, this is not to say that, of course, in traditional societies, people also suffer from death in other different ways, particularly perhaps sometimes they uh, uh, overuse or misuse their bodies in different ways, not so much underuse their bodies uh, as we do, but... Uh, mm-hmm. Particularly in our industrial or industrialized or post-industrial societies, what kind of implications does it have? That's a great question. I mean, there there are many different ways to be a human and to go through this world, right? <laughs> um, yeah. And so I, I I like the caveats to the question. Um, but the way I think about it as a you know an evolutionary biologist is that. Um, our lineage has been walking for at least six million years. It, it's you know, you know, we 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 are a mobile species, and we have been or mobile lineage, and we have been for a very long time. And right now, we are in a situation that, for the first time in the history of our lineage, um, we're not walking anymore. Um, and so we've gone from a walking species to a species that you know. It takes the bus or drives the drives a car instead of instead of walking or takes the elevator instead of going up the stairs. Um, and yes, there there are absolutely quantifiable impacts um, on our physiology. Um, so when I was an undergrad in college, I studied physiology. And um, uh, what I did not learn about because it was discovered more recently um, were things called myokines. Myokines are um, uh, proteins that are released by um, your muscles when they contract, uh, when they're active. And so your muscles are an endocrine organ, which is such a cool thing to think about. Um, you know, we have all these endocrine organs in our bodies that secrete uh, uh, molecules that serve as, you know, almost communication devices of what's going on in your body. Um, your muscles do too. And so when you're active, when you're moving your body, when you're walking, it happens when you're walking, um, myokines are released into into your body. And there have been over 100 different kinds of myokines that have been identified. There are probably many, many, many more yet to be identified. And these target tissues all over your body. They go to your brain. And there are some that have been shown to affect memory because they will will bind with cells in, in the hippocampus of the brain. Uh, and so the hippocampus, for instance, can actually get a little bigger in individuals that start walking more frequently. Uh, typically, these studies are done on older individuals. Um, there are myokines that go to, again, all different tissues of your body that can reduce inflammation response. Um, and so a lot of the sort of, like you said, industrial and post-industrial societies that have diseases that are associated with um, chronic inflammation Mm-hmm. Um, can be reduced with just a daily walk. Um, and so there's a meta-analysis that was done by the University of Maryland a few years back. Um, and it showed that just a 20-minute walk a day, 20 minutes a day, um, can uh, uh, increase lifespan by about five years. And I mean, if that's not a magic pill, I don't know, I don't know what is. People you know, crave a magic pill for their health and a 20-minute walk. Um, by, now, by the way, that, yeah. that thing that we sometimes hear about the 10,000 or 20,000 mm. steps, is that supported by the evidence or? No, there's nothing magic about 10,000. Um, and different individuals are going to have sort of different amounts that they might want to aim for. Um, mm-hmm. I talked to a researcher um, who is uh, um, who studies this. Uh, and she's based at Harvard. And essentially her answer to my question was, what's, you know, what's so special about 10,000? She said nothing. Um, and what she recommends to people is just uh, do a, a little bit more today than you did yesterday um, and try to increase 
um, uh, it, you know, the amount you're taking. And so, you know, if you, if you're, you know, consistently taking 5,000 steps a day, if that's being tracked on your phone or something like that, you know, try to take 6,000, try to take 7,000. Um, if you're consistently taking 9,000, well, yeah, aim for the, aim for the 10, um, you know, in uh, uh, hunter gatherer groups, uh, the Hadza, if you want to aim for that, um, <laughs> that's usually 15 to 16,000 a day uh, is, 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 you know, is that kind of threshold. Um, and so, yeah, again, there's no magic number and that changes as you age and it changes depending on how, uh, you know, how, what, what your, your, your health is anyway at that particular moment. But, you know, it's what I do. I try to get 10,000, you know, and, and it's, again, it's arbitrary. It could be 9,996, right? <laughs> Suddenly you get the 10 and, and, the, and everything turns green as if, you know, you've crossed some magic thresholds, but um, that's, that's not the case. Yeah, maybe it would help if we have some motivation, like, for example, having to steal the meat of some lions to it. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, right. If your survival depends on it, yes, you will You will walk just fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so Dr. De Silva, uh, again, the book is First Steps, How Upright Walking Made Us Human. I'm leaving a link to it in the description box of this interview. And apart from the book, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Sure. So uh, you can uh, look at my website, which I try to uh, update regularly uh, at Dartmouth, Dartmouth College. Um, I, I was on social media for some time, but I've dropped off social media. I, I, I found it to not be useful for me, um, especially since I'm now working on another book uh, and I need to not have those distractions. <laughs> um, and I got to focus focus in on, on uh, the research for the next book. Um, so so hopefully we can we can talk about that when it's out. Yeah, sure. Th thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. It's always a pleasure. Talk to you. Thanks, Ricardo. Yeah, it was good to see you. Thank you very much. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please do not forget to share, like, subscribe, comment. And to keep the channel sustainable, please consider supporting it on Patreon or PayPal. You can find the links in the description box of the interview. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Perga Larson, Jerry Mueller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernard Seixas, Olaf, Alex, Adam Kessel, Matthew Wintingberg, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassi, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Kavana, Mikkel Stormir, Samuel Andreev, Francis Ford, Tiago Nunes, Fergal Kusson, Halle Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Leibrandt, John Linhares, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Oeira, Tom Hummel, Sardus France, David Sloan Wilson, Yassi Ladez, Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegu, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Lowacki, George Stéphanus, Grizio Williamson, P Peter Walazin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Eriksson, Charles Moray, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheist, Larry D. Lee Jr., Old Erringbun, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Igor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zool, Bar Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandon, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Benzliman, George Coriatis, Valentin Steinman, Per Crawley, Kate Von Goller, Alexander Hubbard, Liam Dunaway, B.R., Masood Ali Mohammadi, Perpendicular, and Jonas Hurtner. A special thanks to my producers is our web Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Tom Van Egden, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Giancarlo Montenegro, Alnick Ortiz, and Nick Golden. And to my executive producers, 
Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.